Hi everyone, good evening, and thank you so much for coming. Despite the rains yesterday, we actually thought people may not show up because of the rains, but I think Kanda Baji is in Lahore is pretty good. So people on Zoom are missing Kanda Baji. Sorry for that. But uh, yeah, just a request: please stay on mute while Yashodhar is speaking, and we can have a Q and A later on. So Yash is back. Uh, Yash tracks non-lending financials, fee-based financials. and he had made his presentation internally on wealth management companies so he thought it's interesting to share what insights he has learned uh, through his presentation yash over to you uh thanks ranak uh good evening everyone and thank you all for coming despite the really bad weather out there uh so today we'll be having a look at the wealth management space uh and uh, just a disclaimer before uh, we begin so i'll be mentioning several listed companies in the presentation and Uh, by no means should this be construed as an investment advice recommendation to buy or sell so coming to our topic for today the wealth management industry uh, we are really blessed to be living in a country like india uh, we are the fifth largest economy in the world we are heading towards uh, to become the uh, 5 trillion uh, dollar economy and uh, the financial services sector is booming and growing like anything uh, that's mainly because of significant tailwinds the gdp continues to grow uh, the demographics are in our favor uh, incremental capital flows are moving towards more of financial assets uh, and so what exactly does this mean for the wealth management space so in total investable wealth you know the, all the pots of wealth uh, that are with the hni as, as well as the affluent category uh, that is rising due to the growing economy and this is creating a need for wealth services service of the wealth managers uh if you consider less than uh you know the age group below 50 years of age that happens to be around 75% of our uh, population and this is like a prospective clientele for most of the wealth managers so times are good for this industry and uh, as we go ahead we'll see uh, what it uh, how it really operates so uh we can draw some commonalities between the wealth management profession and the early human civilization so back then at the start of human civilization uh, food security was mainly related uh, as of the wealth was totally related to the food security of the human race crops which were planted they wouldn't grow overnight and once grown they could fully feed a individual a village a community so similarly the concept of wealth management an individual who creates wealth he would want to nurture it grow it preserve it so that he could utilize it at a future date or probably pass it down to his future generations so this let and i mean uh, this is very much similar to uh, you know the idea and again so uh, succession planning estate i mean these are the core pillars of wealth management so since uh, you know the most of the uh, wealth management revolves around estate planning succession avoiding taxation passing down the wealth to the uh, succeeding generations uh so there's a book written by mr charles dickens and there's a show directed on the same book uh, on bbc so this uh, show talks about a family who wait in vain to inherit money from a disputed fortune uh, in a settlement of a extremely long running lawsuit so wealth management as depicted in the show as well uh, was mainly done by lawyers in those days and accountants who were mainly associated with the family and the way we you know uh, the the way it is professionalized now it wasn't sort of a profession profession back then so the professionals a generation or two later uh, like you know in the mid 19th century or so they morphed from the role of social trustees to profit seekers so just a quick primer about this uh, in uh, industry So uh, the genesis of this industry date back to the early medieval Europe days where the knights would leave for crusades and they would leave the lands vulnerable to be seized by the church the state rival noblemen So what uh, to prevent this from uh, happening what they would do is they would separate the legal ownership from the beneficial ownership they would package it into a trust appoint a trustee for the same uh, and the, 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 I mean they would leave for the crusades and this is the way they would prevent uh, you know the lands and the assets being seized so this method of separation of legal ownership from the beneficial ownership and creating a trust proved a very eff efficient and highly effective method of preserving wealth uh, the recognition of you know as a professional status of wealth management did not begin until the mid 19th century uh, again around uh, 1990 or so uh, a liverpool based accountant named george tasker 
he decried the state of affairs of this industry that there's no proper regular uh, reg- uh, regulatory framework there's no standardized approach so uh, basically the letter which he wrote it brought to the attention of many readers and professionals in the same field they suggested that they should meet up and they should discuss about you know what better ways uh, by, by by what better ways can they make make this industry a more structured one there could be proper approach to it the standardized framework where everybody you know do things in a same framework so in 1991 at the inaugural meeting nearly 82 participate participants joined for this a year later uh, the total count of it became 1000 so uh, you know as the borders of almost all the countries are becoming permeable uh, wealth managers have more assets to diversify the clients wealth across uh, so initially uh, during those times uh, you know the the uh, clients of the wealth managers were basically called the leisure class who numbered in low four figures as the wealth became more global it became more diverse uh, the i mean the wealth has become more diverse since then uh that the work of a wealth manager has become more challenging where he has you know been uh, getting access to different assets across the world so wealth managers can be considered as architects as they are responsible for creating complex multifunction structures as opposed to a brick and mortar structure the structures here are consists of organizational entities linked to each other such as foundations trusts and which serve multiple purposes like you know uh, succession planning uh passing it down to the next generation uh, uh, avoiding of taxes etc a decade later sorry so uh during the mid uh, early 1920s or so the, the most of the private banks what they would do is they would start segregating the customers based on the wealth levels and this is was the early start of the uh, wealth management industry in uh, us so these banks they would offer their specialized services to them and as the economic levels grew the activities grew the economic levels started rising people there were more number of hnis and ultra hnis you know which started to grow in uh, the country there were more companies who started offering the services and from a concentrated market became more of a fragmented market now in the past 2 three decades or so if you consider there have been multiple changes which have been happening in this industry the total engagement patterns are changing tech has been making rounds in this industry as well as similar to other industries it's becoming more of uh, so the the entire client engagement patterns are changing the way certain things are expected by the clients even that is changing so clients are becoming more aware about the different asset classes their risk profiles and what sort of things to expect from you know their own asset uh, allocation profiles so they are requ- i mean they have certain goals and you know targets to be met so they require certain one of a kind structures for the unique requirements and in this industry you wouldn't find it's, it's not uncommon for you to find a wealth manager working with the second or third generation of the original client because this business entirely works on trust so there's a great book written uh, by brook harrington on wealth management it talks about the uh, evolution of the wealth management how wealth uh, management grew over the years the relationship between the wealth manager and the client how that relationship has been changing what are the things that are expected by the client as well as uh, the wealth manager how are they able to diversify the wealth across different borders and uh, how do the clients continue to you know preserve their wealth and how do they uh, continue to be uh, getting richer so in this business if you to summarize it the raw material is basically the capital and the theater of operations for the wealth manager is the entire globe so so if you consider like the functions of a wealth manager it goes around in a full circle right from the the time you acquire a client all the way till you you know the entire service goes on a full circle so basically once a client is uh, onboarded the initial task happens with uh, creating a information investment policy statement so the client or the well or the of the wealth manager he has to share all the possible details with the wealth manager because there are a lot of factors which affect the fortunes of the client so it is basically the fiduciary duty of the wealth manager to protect the client's assets so right from the time the uh, policy statement is prepared 
all the way till a strategic asset allocation of the uh, client is prepared it go it it is the portfolio is typically monitored it's reviewed periodically and again if there are any changing life circumstances in the client's life the policy statement is altered again and it just goes on in a full circle so i'll be discussing several trends so i've just summarized it for now so these are the uh, several trends which uh, are shaping the future of the wealth management industry and they are quite monumental in you know for the future of the wealth industry as well so starting with the growing stock of wealth so the total pot of assets that are available for a wealth manager to diversify the client's money so all of them are growing so to name some you would have the entire stock market capitalization the total float available the entire mutual fund industry aifs which is again fancy of most of the ultra hnis uh assets which are getting monetized there are esops there are i mean the the business are being sold so the money which is created is getting added back into the wealth management industry there's a rising pool of hnis uh, the number of affluence in this industry are growing which is again creating a potential clientele for the wealth managers so over the i mean over a period of time it has been the regulators constant uh, need to make investing for the retail investors as well as all the investors a cost beneficial affair where they want to reduce the cost of investing for the investors and make it accessible to almost everyone we have seen how this industry began from a concentrated industry and got converted into a fragmented industry where there are multiple players who are operating in this segment so in in terms of the new products which are being launched you have multiple products which are being launched on the simpler side as well as the complex side there are many new products which are being developed as we speak the engagement patterns are changing tech is creating i mean there are multiple new fintechs which are creating sort of a disruption for the wealth managers and traditional wealth managers who have been operating in this space the new investors that are getting created they have certain expectations and their sort of traits are quite different from the first gen investor that we uh, know about again the uh, in this industry the role of a wealth ad- uh, manager or advisor is quite crucial and we'll understand how so we'll go over through these trends one by one in a little more detail so considering the total uh, asset pool across the globe so this is the total economic size of almost all the countries put together which amounts to close to 530 or trillion half of it is made up of uh, in the form of physical goods like real estate uh, art wine watches etc and which continues to garner investor interest and this is nearly half of it around 260 or trillion then you have the entire indian mutual fund industry which is again growing and uh, another pot of wealth for the wealth managers to diversify the clients funds so this has grown at a handsome 17% cagr all the way from 2012 to 2023 what started off with around 7 trillion in assets it's grown to almost 40 trillion the story says the same for af assets as well uh, which has grown from uh, at a c- 57% cagr it has grown from close to 100 billion to almost 4000 billion again the same story for pms assets uh, advisory has grown at around uh, 10% cagr you have the discretionary space which is again growing at around 17% cagr and non discretionary has grown at around 24% cagr so this is the next big category uh, available for most of the wealth managers to play around uh the total uh, this is, i mean that there there are close to 50 million or uh, 50 sorry 50 million or uh hni investors hni and affluent investors this is a almost 50 billion dollar kind of an un- untapped segment so most of the universal banks are considering this segment uh, as it's a pro- i mean they consider this a prominent customer segment so one third of the banks are not exploring this segment at as the key concern arises for them of profitability as they do not contribute significantly to the profit pool so some wealth managers they are offering uh, you know pure robo advisory kind of services which uh, have commoditized offering and mass personalization services so although this is a cost efficient approach lack of diversification is parking clients uh, stickiness and they may switch between different uh, uh, platforms for better prices and better uh, customer experience 
so the average age for uh, hni is in uh, overall across the globe is reducing now it stands around 37 so over a period of you know some down somewhere down the line probably this is what it might look like where young children might be getting uh, really uh, rich and they might just choose to have an advisor so uh, it's not only in india where the there there's been focus on regulations there have been certain changes in india where upfront fees were banned uh there's completely a trail model which uh, distributors have to follow so other countries have been no exception where things have been changing as well so singapore is a country where there are many ultra or high net worth individuals and they most of them have opted for a commission kind of a model they they have they voted no for a uh, pay for kind of an advice model they did not want it so singapore has focused a lot on strengthening the regulations they have focused a lot on compliance and they make sure that the uh, point of sale disclosures are on point so that there's no conflict conflict of interest and everything just goes smooth in european union it's only england and uk who have a complete ban on commissions whereas most of the countries uh, they follow partial ban and they follow mifid 2 regulations uh canada has a uh, diversified mod distribution model where banks account for around uh, 37% full service brokers plus wealth managers account for another uh, 35 odd percent of which around 45% is non so of the assets uh, that i uh, uh, with wealth managers close to 50 odd percent comes from uh, non discretionary accounts which are completely fee based USA again similar to the way we have a distributor kind of a structure here in India uh, USA is bit different so they have uh, entirely uh, operations running by brokers or RIs so the manufacturer doesn't pay anything to the uh, the distributors these are mainly RIs or brokers the investors pay a certain fee for uh, the assets which are under the regulation So in India, it's been quite difficult for a advisor to function. There are there are barely fourteen hundred or uh, RIs. So uh, the main the, the reasons being in two thousand thirteen, uh, there there were certain regulations which uh, separated the two. A distributor cannot be an advisor due to conflict of interest. The fees for an advisor are again capped. They can charge one point two five lakh per annum or two point five percent of the value uh, of assets under advice. and there have been many other compliances which is making the cost of operations very high for uh, these advisors so they are trying not to uh, get into this profession and besides india has a history of commission driven model uh, that is making it difficult for co con consumers to uh, consciously choose a uh, ri because of the fees which are involved and nobody wants to pay for uh, advice which they otherwise think would be available for free So there have been several exits uh, from of foreign players from this uh, market. So Royal Bank of Scotland as well as Morgan Stanley, they have uh, the wealth, the private wealth department. They have exited India. So this is a fragmented industry as we speak. Uh, so there are several players which uh, I mean started off with banks. There are private banks and some PSUs who offer wealth management services. Uh, the cost of acquisition for them is very low. They have high entry barriers. and they benefit from the cross selling opportunities they have uh, strong uh, competition from the wealth management specialists they are mainly foreign and they there are some indian players as well uh, they offer managed and structured products and the main focus is on ultra hni segment there are several global investment banks who offer as investment they i mean the main service offering is investment banking also along with that they offer uh, wealth management services their main focus is on ultra hni as well and their positioning is quite weak so brokers and national distributors again they have a quite a wide distribution network they again mainly offer uh, mutual fund products and they might offer some structured products as well they, their main focus uh, target group is uh, not the hni segment but mainly the affluent or uh, somewhere between 10 to 15 or 25 odd crores then you have the family offices who uh, mainly provide advisory services for sp specific client segments such as entrepreneurs and then you have robo advisory which is an upcoming category so these are these can be fully automated or they are kind of digital services which they provide with some human intervention involved they are mainly for small ticket sizes so all the new fintechs are operating in this space 
the cost is very low and uh, i mean these are the ones who are causing all the disruption in the space so in terms of the product uh, simplicity and complexity so you have simple products on you know if you consider the entire spectrum you have simple products like etfs passives index funds which are you know launched and on the other hand other hand uh, there are many new products which are kind of fancy of the ultra rich and investors so you might have seen in the past 2 3 years how bitcoin or current uh, cryptocurrency became really popular and so most of the currencies or even uh, non fungible tokens this was out of the purview of the wealth managers but certain wealth managers are trying to test the waters in crypto so julius bear for example they allow their customers to trade and hold crypto assets in conjunction with their uh, partner digital asset bank called seba hsbc also is offering thematic funds uh that invest in metaverse linked uh, activities such as virtualization there are new fintechs such as stash away who are starting to incorporate crypto assets uh exposure into their advisory services for accredited investors so selling an nft is be- has become really simple all you have to just convey that this is an nft so the engagement patterns are changing as well so so the top the, the blue boxes indicate the top two uh, engagement preferences for uh, high net worth investors so digital inefficiency it affects the client life cycle so covid 19 it actually necessitated the uh, push towards dig- digitalization and uh, that made several uh, client touch points and in, it, it actually influenced the ultra rich and expectations so these channels they operate in isolation and they cannot be synchronized with one another so basically you cannot have a mobile app which is 100% functioning but not focus enough on other engagement uh, channels so although now the wealth management uh, entire client base is skewing towards younger population they cannot ignore uh, focusing more on the dig- digitalization and uh, enhancing the customer experience on these digital channels so if you ask a question where do companies stand in the entire area of tech adoption and digital transformation so we can to to answer that we can sort of create three blocks the foundation stage maximizing the efficiency where you try to rationalize the id footprint you make sure that the resources that are available at your disposal are op- uh, are sort of automated so that you can free up the client's time sorry the wealth manager's time to uh, to be spent more with the uh, client and then expand in the value where you create certain apis you uh, add on to your uh, ai ml tools to automate most of the tasks so if you talk about the foundational stage uh, most of the companies are already there covid 19 actually accelerated this particular phase where most of the companies started investing more into uh, their uh, it tech and most of the spend is going towards uh, r and d for it in terms of maximizing efficiency most of the companies are somewhere there not 100% yet but the the investments are going towards it, this area and in terms of expanding the value the companies are basically just starting out so we'll see how what uh, you know companies are exactly doing and how they would, they would be utilizing the spend so in terms of robo advisors this is exactly what won't happen the ro- robots are not going to slap you come and slap you for any uh, wrong answer that you have picked and th- to correct that so what will exactly happen is over time the uh, algorithm will actually make the robot advisor better it will be making better suggestions better predictions the analytical tools will be more efficient and the customer will be able to uh, you know get a better reasoning with the kind of allocation that he wants so in terms of integration of fintechs with affluence uh, so in terms of the total market size affluent is a big category that is available uh, to o- almost all the wealth managers to tap but the issue arises in terms of the cost of acquisition private banks have it easy uh, that they onboard a customer and then they later cross sell these products to them but for a pure play wealth manager it it's it's quite difficult to onboard these clients the cost of acquisition is quite high and then they don't have enough assets to contribute to the profitability of the wealth manager so basically this is where the fintechs and other companies come in where these sort of clients can be serviced better with uh, the fintech companies or the robo advisory platforms or they they can provide some sort of uh, like a 50 50 kind of an approach a digital approach where some services are automated for them some services where a human uh, uh, rm could be involved 
and basically they could even be offered mass personalization services which again will be entirely a tech based customization for them so if i have to segregate the activities of an rm so core activities are the ones which where the client uh, whether a uh, client is spending with the rm so basically rm's activities if you look at the non core activities some, some are middle and back office tasks where uh, such as tax compliance and other activities so certain activities can be automated and he could free up some time to be uh, engaging more with the client so this is happening mainly because uh, so nearly 2/3 of the client's time is going towards these non non core activities so that is mainly happening because of lack of digital readiness or low focus on an omni channel strategy so basically investments are needed further to reverse this paradigm and automate certain routine tasks as that will free up their time to spend more with the client so what uh, so what are the traits of the next gen investor so these are as the age average age of the high net worth individual or the affluent category is reducing so their traits are kind of different from the first gen investor that we usually talk about and there's a wealth transfer which is also going to happen from the uh, baby boomers to the uh, the next generation so these clients basically they want uh, or they expect advice to be tailored as per their unique circumstances since some, most of the times they are the ones who are responsible for creating their wealth they want to be in control of the wealth and they would like to take some of the decisions they would like to try different uh, asset classes by themselves they'll use multiple sources to check or uh, verify different or corroborate different uh, uh, investment classes and probably reach at a conclusion and then try different advisors probably just to make sure that they are getting the right sort of advice similar to the way all the alternative assets afs are accessible to the ultra hna investors even they would like to try these investments out and mainly there since they are born and brought up in more of a digitized environment they prefer more of a digital kind of a experience when interacting with the wealth managers so how important is a ro role of a advisor or counselor so when it comes to ultra hna or hna investors when the investable amount is quite large the risk for investment of this large amount is equally high so this is why engaging with these professionals and experience it's quite suitable for them and it is a quite a prudent measure there are biases which are involved which the advisors or the wealth managers tend to mitigate so it's quite crucial for uh, them to interact with the wealth managers so a bit about the indian wealth management space uh, so contextually uh, the wealth management space in india has been in existence for almost quarter of a century so it went from a single product advisory to a multi product goal oriented kind of wealth management and it has been a gradual progression so basically back then in those early days it was mainly the bank accounts plus the certain investment options which were provided by lic which were the only means of preserving wealth so along with gradual changes in the economy as the economy started growing there were multiple uh, as a mutual fund market started to grow Uh, various financial institutions came up as the number of hnis and ultra hnis also started increasing there were uh, services which were offered to them and this is how the entire growth of wealth management industry took place so again from what started as a con concentrated industry it became a fragmented one although it can still be considered that it is a nascent stage because the entire wealth management assets are barely 9 10% of the entire gdp so again uh, india is benefiting uh, i mean the entire wealth management space in india is benefiting by pro positive trends the demographics are in a favor that there are rising income levels average age of uh, the hnis is reducing there's a startup ecosystem where most of the people are offered uh, esops as well so which is uh, increasing the total wealth available towards this so the the, the need for wealth services is felt even more there's a greatest wealth transfer which is happening across the world almost 70 trillion odd uh, dollars of assets are going to change hands in the next decade or two and again we have a growing mutual fund space there are new products which are being launched in the thematic category in the sectoral uh, category and this space is growing even more 
which is providing a huge investable asset base for most of the wealth managers to diversify the client's assets. So India has been no exception to uh, consolidation and uh, competition in this space. So according to a study done by PwC, one in six wealth managers won't uh, will cease to exist by 2027. So basically Indian wealth managers, they're operating in these three spaces. So there are traditional wealth managers who offer holistic end-to-end -end services. So you have the traditional wealth managers who have a wide uh, distribution network. They prefer engaging with the client face-to-face. -face. They have a comp uh, comprehensive uh, uh, you know, product portfolio. The clients they cater to are typically fall in the ultra h segment above 50 crores odd. Their value proposition is that there'll be a dedicated advisor, a dedicated RM for uh, the solutions of the client base. And the fee structure is typically on a higher side, around 75 odd basis points to 1.5 uh, as a percentage of AUM. Next, you have the advisor assisted who do not provide holistic services. I mean, it's well understood by. Uh, their business models is mainly phone based plus uh, some digital digitalization so this is a fragile approach so the client base wouldn't be fall wouldn't be falling under the ultra HNI category but this is mainly affluent plus a bit of client base who are above 15 20 odd crores the value proposition is that they provide affordable pricing and they again have a diversified portfolio approach where the fee structure is a bit lower so it's around 0 0.3 to 0 0.67 uh, per percentage of the annual uh, the total AUM and again, automated, they basically provide simply the uh, financial planning advice. They are completely automated, completely software based. Uh, their client type is mainly the millennials or the new segment who are coming into this uh, fold. They are very convenient and this is what the customers basically want uh, at a very low cost. The fee structure again is very low, 0.2% uh, to 0.5% of the uh, AUM. So these are several deals that have happened in the past decade. Uh, there are several private equity companies who have been investing in the wealth management space. So the valuations have been quite, uh, you know, stark. We'll be going over that in a bit detail. But these are the several deals that have happened. So one of which is PAG had invested uh, in Newama, which is now uh, going to get listed as a separate entity, as a wealth manager. So they invested around 2400 odd crores for 15% stake. IFL Wealth Management acquired l and Capital Markets in 2019. So, uh, several private equity players had invested in IFL Wealth as well. The two players which exist, exited the Indian market, so Sanctum Wealth had acquired Royal Bank of Scotland, Standard Chartered Bank had acquired Morgan Stanley. And similar to India, across the globe, there are several deals which are happening as well. So Rathbone's uh, company based in UK, they acquired Investec Wealth. Uh, Royal Bank of Canada, they acquired a company named Bruin Dolphin. Uh, Credit Suisse was acquired by UBS. And these deals are happening not because of stress or certain headwinds which is faced by the industry, but this is mainly happening because the private equity investors find this business model quite appealing. It is uh, It has less uh, onerous capital requirements as uh, compared to the other financial services companies in the space. And this, this is why this, this space has been the fancy of most of the private equity investors. So coming to the business model of wealth managers, so you have, so I've uh, put a dotted line to segregate the distribution advisory services because they cannot typically be the, uh, you cannot being a distributor provide advisory services as well. So you have one set of services which are pure distribution services along with which you provide other services like value services like estate planning uh, in, in terms of entire financial planning, etc. So where you're providing the distribution of third party products for which you're getting a trail uh, direct, uh, commissions directly from the manufacturer. On the other side, you ha can bundle these services and put it under advisory, but typically the services are provided uh, as advisory where the fees are charged directly from the client as a percentage of the assets under advice. They provide broking services as well where certain stocks or bonds are added into the client's uh, portfolio for which they charge a brokerage fee. And again, they provide, uh, they work as an NBFC where certain, uh, uh, they provide short-term financing uh, to the client if they have it, if they have any particular needs. And all these fees are directly taken from the client. 
so since uh, you know the main one of the main source of revenues for most of these players under the distribution model is the commission so these are the some of the distributors uh, or wealth uh, managers you can call who are providing uh, distribution services so especially after 2018 the commissions are coming under pressure you can see a short spike in the last two years as mainly because of the kind of fees that were they were offered i mean you can say that they have some sort of negotiation power with the manufacturer but typically most of the wealth managers or distributors across the world there is some sort of fee compression which is happening in terms of the economics if i have if i have to split between advisory and distribution so advisory if i split into three buckets one is discretionary services along with advisory where they typically charge around 45 to 60 65 or basis points depending on the uh, portfolio size of the client the smaller ones don't usually have that kind of a negotiating power but along with the introduction of newer players who uh, you know typically charge a lower fee there has been some competition and in general the the total kind of revenues are under pressure then the other category would be non discretionary where the fees are a bit lower around 30 to 45 odd basis points again uh, bit depending on the size of the asset that the client holds and the if you provide only advice services it's a very low kind of retention business where the fees charged are barely 10 to 20 odd basis points and on the distribution side you either distribute managed accounts and mutual funds so mutual funds typically the split is between equity and debt is 60 to 40% uh net net you retain around 50 60 odd basis points depending on uh, where the percentages are between equity and debt and managed accounts a bit higher around uh, 18 to 90 basis points so cumulatively for the entire distribution side you make close to 75 odd ba basis points as a retention this is uh, before costs so talking about some of the expenses one of the major expense uh, for most wealth managers is the employee cost so net net retention or after uh, is around 70 to odd 80 odd basis points of which 25 to 30% goes towards employee cost this is for a larger player but uh, you know the ones who are starting out the ones who are smaller in size the employee cost would be typically lower as the cost to hire rms uh, is typically higher in the initial years then as you progress as the vintage of the rms increase the cost typically start uh, going lower and they benefit from uh, operating leverage other expenses are barely 10 to 15 uh, depending upon the it spend so now what is going to happen is most since most of the companies are investing quite heavily into r&d and developing their it uh, and getting the tools ready for you know most of the fintech side these costs are also going to rise and barely the other costs are the other expenses which they have to incur on day to day basis so net net did in india they retain close to 50% as uh, pre tax margins So since we are talking about uh, employee cost typically how it's structured is the wealthier a client uh, there will be 10 5 to 10 odd clients under one particular rm as you go lower in the hierarchy there will be uh, many more uh, clients work, typically working under one rm so how they are structured is a rm would be particularly looking at a client who would be associated with multiple other uh, professionals such as investment analyst strategist financial planner product specialist lawyer and taxation expert so the question of a particular rm quitting and then starting something of his own and pulling the clientele away that typically doesn't happen because rm cannot work alone he has he needs support from most of the other professionals as well so when you talk about fees and commissions uh, what is better or what is not so it's not the question about either or or so basically with a particular model that a particular regulator has chosen the controls and have to be enforced at by every uh, point of sale where there are certain disclosures which should be mandated and this is the way that things would be set in order so what is happening across the globe so if you look at the last two bars uh, western europe and north america they are quite heavy on fee income that's where they are already headed if you look at india uh, which is a co completely commission driven market so the push idly is towards an advisory model where most of the wealth managers are trying to push uh, their own services towards more of a fee income which is sort of fixed 
based on the clientele and that that gives more predictability so how are numbers looking like across the globe so so rocbv is return on client business volumes so in 2021 22 there was a slight dip in the volumes because of which again the uh, retentions have been uh, slightly lower the cost has been rising because of the rising spend on tech pre-tax margins are almost 35% on an average the client business volumes have dipped in 2021 and again in 22 there's a degrowth in those two years so when i split these numbers into four geographies one is north america the pre-tax margins are close to 40 odd percent and that is moving lower because again the spend is going to be continue to remain high due to investments into uh, R&D and tech. Western Europe, uh, because of the high cost already involved, the pre-tax margins are pretty low. So they are not 25% odd, so just one fourth they are retaining. Latin America is again close to 40 odd percent. Asia Pacific has been uh, kind of going down because of the regulations which have been involved on uh, the total expense ratios. So, uh, I'll just quickly explain what's happening on the slides to uh, too much of data. So, here on the left, these are the uh, uh, deals that have happened from by a private equity player which has been investing into. So, the green bars on top, they represent the uh, traditional wealth managers, the bolder dark green bars, they represent the digital players. So, the average valuation at which these deals have happened is around 1.6% uh, uh, of the AUM. And the digital wealth managers, the deals there, they have happened at around 10% uh, on, uh, on an average. So in the past 2-3 years, there's a lot of activity which has been happening uh, from the private equity side into the digital wealth managers. So if you see the share of the, uh, the wealth management in uh, total digital assets, that is gone up from 5% to 11% uh, percent in 2021. Again, 2021 is the, the tall bar on the bottom right corner. That is where you know, the maximum uh, activities happened in 2021. Most of it is concentrated in America as currently. Again, India has its own uh, deals that have happened. So, uh, some of the deals and the valuation that have happened in this space is Rathbones, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, they acquired Investec for around 1.75% uh, of their assets. Royal Bank of Canada, which acquired Bru uh, Bruin Dolphin, they paid around 3.25%. Uh, Bain Capital had invested in uh, IFL at around 10% kind of valuations. Uh, Verso Wealth, um, another wealth management company, they acquired CDC Wealth Management for around 6-7% of their AUM. So these are some of the deals that have happened and the valuations have been quite stark for traditional wealth managers and uh, the digital wealth managers. So these are the valuations of some of the Indian companies. Uh, so IFL well currently uh, it's growing at around 12% uh, CAGR the bottom line with a market cap of around 20,000 uh, decent pat margins AUM of around 1,60,000 odd crores so around price to the total assets around 11% so Anand Rathi isn't a proper wealth manager but they provide wealth management services so main activities of distribution of third party products and they bundle it with value-added services which are provided for free. Prudent is mainly a distributor, uh, a platform where most of the other distributors can uh, sort of get registered with and they can opt for distribution services through them. Neoma Wealth is uh, it's delisted from the main entity and they would be listing on their own now. So on an op approximate basis, uh, the valuation is close to would be close to 5,000 odd crores. The part margins are around 17% and uh, again, they would be getting a price to EM of around 8%. So what are the growth prospects of this industry? So there's almost 70 trillion of assets will, which will be changing hands. So the, there'll be a need for financial advisors, there'll be need for wealth managers who would be uh, putting the wealth which is uh, which would be received by the affluent and HNI class and they would be putting it to better use. They would be uh, uh, handling that wealth. There's a ESOP culture as well. So there are several firms, there are several private banks who are quite specialized in handling the ESOPs. So Morgan Stanley, they uh, oversee around $2 trillion of stock assets for almost 6.2 million employees. That is half of the US market. Again, there's a rising affluent class, which is going to be a significant uh, asset, uh, 
prospective client pool for most of the wealth managers there rise of robo advisors which are sort of creating a disrupting field for uh, the traditional wealth players as the there are, there's a pressure on their commissions the fees are kind of reducing there's going to be a higher spend involved and ultimately there will be a need for wealth preservation because it, there are you know there are certain times which are volatile there are unstable times as you've seen in the previous year so there will be need of wealth managers to help them uh, navigate through these difficult times thank you uh, thank you yash uh, we'll now take the questions from the audience in the uh, hall and then we will go to the zoom after that anybody has any questions you stressed a lot on this aif and you said the hnis are referring can you explain that in detail what is it and how is it different from the so yeah so there are three categories uh, the assets which are involved in the c category are slightly different there are, in category three you will have the real estate assets and multiple other assets which are not typically accessible in for a retail investor so it's mainly where uh, most of the ultra rich and hnis go and invest their uh, money into these park their money into these funds so they are mainly accessible to the ultra rich and categories so the real estate or some of the other asset classes for the matter yeah so in aif there are three categories the third category is where uh, it's a very risky product so they have kept it separately that is a category where you can have leverage strategies or long shot kind of strategies and things like that that is the uh, category with the least amount of uh, regulatory favor as it were the first category is the most preferred one where uh, they are encouraging uh, s- uh, smaller companies so startup kind of funds or funds with good uh, social objective and things like that category 2 is uh, which is not the extreme of a uh, very very desirable one nor is it the extremely risky one over there you could have various kinds of uh, asset classes you could have real estate you could have uh, the lower rated uh, credit products so credit risk funds have fallen out of favor from the mutual funds uh, those are well suited for the aif kind of structure where the people know that it's a risky product and again liquidity may not be uh, that high it could be even uh, listed equity where instead of a pms structure uh, you have a almost mutual fund kind of structure where people pool in money and it's a unitized thing where uh, investors don't get to see the portfolio on a real time basis so uh, yeah various kinds of uh, structures can be created and it's uh, as yes mentioned minimum investment amount is 1 crore if you want to invest in these kind of structures i did the got to go at that so that's so uh, people who are interested could look up uh, mint articles mint has been running uh, a series on these kind of funds so actually they have just uh, highlighted some two uh, real estate funds where one fund gave 6% cagr over 7 8 years another fund gave a total cumulative return of 17% not per annum o- over 7 to 10 years whatever the period was and still part of the money is stuck they haven't been able to realize everything and they've extended the maturity by one year yeah so it's uh, a mixed bag uh, sometimes returns can be exceptional most times returns are somewhat lower than public markets also and tax wise it's not but attractive for most investors yeah but it gives you bragging rights so in a party circuit you can say i've bought a index fund and claim many bragging rights hello uh, rajiv thanks for reading my article so that was my article and uh uh one thing that we notice is that uh, we are uh, getting a lot of complaints saying the commissions are extremely high so uh, uh, what they do normally do uh, that is i got to know by talking to advisors is that 
distributors come to them and they say, hey, uh, you are a very rich guy. You shouldn't be investing in a mutual fund. Instead, you should be, you're the rich guy. You're in the in a different league. So for you, the suitable product are H, H and I, uh, RD, uh, sorry, the AIFs and the PMS. But ultimately, we have to understand that they are people just like us. So when they lose money, they feel equally sad. And <laughs> that is just what is happening. Uh, and I have a question for the presenter also. So you talked about uh, this robo advisors getting a lot of traction. Just wanted to understand how the business model works there. How do they, you know, kind of recommend products? Do they recommend mutual funds? And how do they cater to different needs of people? So right now, uh, the kind of fintechs that we have in our sp uh, operating in our space, so they would be Zero Dark, Covera, they're already providing different services. So of which, RoboAdvisor is basically a platform where uh, the investor can get certain views or, you know, connect to a advisor, like an obviously in a virtual mode. So these are the kind of services that are currently offering. So that, that this is just as of start. Also, what is happening is there are certain private banks who are opting, I mean, they are buying out the fintechs to provide services to the uh, probably the affluent kind of category. So these are not typical just pure, pure robo-advisory services that they are offering. They are part of a big bank or they are part of some other companies who are uh, trying to create sort of a robo-advisory structure where they can, you know, target these affluent or HNI kind of categories. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, yes, you spoke about since 2018 or 19, the yields of distributors have gone up. But on the flip side, the yields for manufacturers have gone down. So, is it just transfer of... Uh, no, no, I don't know. Mentions have gone up. They have gone down. No, I think in the for the distributors, the yield has gone up, right? In the last... In the last one or two years where they are... So, is there something specific? Uh, no, I think it was just uh, the commissions that they were, I mean, they have the negotiating power ultimately with them. These are the large distributors operating in our space. So in the past one or two years, uh, I mean, a lot of NFOs and other kind of newer products came into the scenario, which were priced at sort of, you know, higher commission structures, which had higher commission structures. So this is the only reason why that sort of spread has increased. So usually between a manufacturer and a distributor, I mean, uh, who has that pricing power? So from the looks of it, it looks like the distributor. But I mean, in general, as the total expense ratios are compressing, they would be passing it on to the distributors. I mean, that's where they would they would again start making money as in the manufacturers. Okay. So in 2018, when the TRs dropped, was everything passed to the distributors or? Nearly, almost 65-35 is what you can say. 70-30 or kind of a ratio. Correct. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Ash. Uh, I'm sure these companies would be generating a lot of cash. Like, uh, so, like, among these four companies which you showed, so what are some of this, like, you know, capital allocation strategies they would be using to outpart each other, or, you know, to increase the business as compared to others? So, right. in which areas are they spending? So, they all these companies are dividend paying companies. That's one. Secondly, a lot of spend has been going towards tech, as I mentioned. Some of the companies which are just starting out for them, they need the cash to, uh, because they need RMs to service the clients. So it's only when you have the RMs with a decent amount of vintage where you stop adding new RMs into your company. But until then, the spend continues. So there's a massive amount of investment which is going towards r and towards, uh, you know, the fintechs or digitalization. So this is where mainly the capital allocation is going towards. Yeah, hi. Uh, so is there any kind of cyclical uh, aspect to the aspect to this industry, at least in the listed space? Did you do you see it move? the profits or the income move with the market or is it slightly non-cyclical? Yeah, so it is cyclical in the sense because their revenues are kind of linked to uh, the manuf manufacturers. If the volumes in general dip, the, f uh, the fees that they charge as a percentage of the total assets even they dip. So there are times when we have seen cyclical pressures in this industry.
if there are no questions here we can request the audience on zoom if they have any questions uh, please ask us you can unmute yourself and ask the question it seems even zoom audiences don't have any question thank you so much guys uh, just one second there's one question over here uh, uh thanks for the presentation uh, uh so one question uh maybe to rajiv uh, i think in in your earlier conversation you had you had you had said that you would rather uh, so with with positions and banks you are kind of taking uh, you are kind of participating in insurance as well as ams three uh so is that the case? so how would you take a wealth management industry would you want to uh, take exposure out of uh, out of listed banks and go to entities as as mentioned or maybe uh, another few which might which might come for listing over the years or you would still want to uh, stay with banks and and if so uh, why i mean thank you so you have to evaluate each company on its own merits but generally speaking people who are from the banking space have some sort of advantage in terms of lower client acquisition cost uh, so what happens is let's say you go out and open a normal savings bank account where your uh, salary is credited or where your professional income comes or where your business is operating now the, your entire banking transaction is open to the bank rm in terms of what are your monthly inflows what is the amount of savings that you do where do you actually invest and they can trend come and pitch to you whereas someone who's a pure uh, wealth manager who probably has a stock brokerage arm or uh, who has a distribution license or who has a rie license for that person even to get the initial meeting with you is a challenge and uh they have to do a lot of cold calling even to get a uh, foot in the door the other aspect is you would have seen in the income breakup slide that he has had that uh commission income and fee income is one portion of it but they also benefit from the uh, lending and borrowing that they do with the clients so some of their clients may want a loan against shares so a uh, uh, hni who has a is company shares may have a temporary liquidity need to uh, buy a house for example and bridge financing so those kind of things uh, are easier for a bank to do rather than a wealth manager who probably just has a advisory or a distribution license or maybe a small uh, nbfc operation the again the a uh, bank kind of uh, teams will have the typically the entire product suite including uh, their own in house uh, funds be it the mutual fund products or the uh, aif products pms products insurance products so, so they can offer a whole uh, suite of products the disadvantage that banks have typically is that uh, in the usual case they see a lot of uh, these uh, rm churn uh, where the uh comfort with the client is lost when the person is replaced that's where boutique firms end up scoring where uh, if those people serving the clients are also co-owners in that uh wealth management firm uh, that then it becomes a lifelong relationship kind of thing and the trust levels are higher so sometimes uh what has been seen in the bank led models is that uh they are vulnerable to quarterly earning pressures and targets and things like that whereas in a uh, rm owned wealth management boutique those pressures uh, don't seem to be there to that bigger extent so to that extent sometimes the boutiques also end up winning long answer to a short question i guess that's it Thank you Yash for a lovely presentation and thank, thank you audience thank you thank you When our things got rough I always remember what my father used to say 
running a business does test a man my son there are ups and downs glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated the character of a man and the character of a business are not very different are they yes but when the chips are down we must stand up dust ourselves off and more wrong volatility it's a funny thing it makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions sure you can question some of your decisions but stay steadfast on your goals dad always said there are no shortcuts and no quick profits there are no free lunches are there there is only one right way at ppfs we think like rahul and his father that volatility is a fact of running a business and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business we use value investing principles to manage your money this means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term ppfas mutual fund there's only one right way mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully